Hello, good morning. Welcome. Good, good. How, how's everyone? Doing well? Good to see all of you this morning. Um, happy Palm Sunday. That's exciting. Holy Week coming up this week. Um, so I'm excited for that. Um, what else is going on? Welcome. Uh, welcome to our equipping hour. Uh, my name is Slade, uh, for those of you that might not know me. Um, and I kind of have the privilege of leading us through our um, equipping hour or our Sunday school or our discipleship class uh, this spring. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the topic of sanctification and, and also along with that uh, spiritual disciplines that help and aid us as we seek after God uh, in that way. Um, yeah, so we've kind of been covering kind of two topics. We've been talking about the theology of sanctification. Uh, we've been using Jerry Bridges' book, um, Pursuit of Holiness, this one right here, um, to kind of talk about that and then develop a theology and a mindset of holiness and of sanctification. And then we've also been talking about various practices or disciplines that can help us as we seek after God in that, in that way. And we've been using Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, to talk about those practices or disciplines. Um, I hope that has been helpful for all of you. Uh, this is week seven. Um, we're a little over halfway, so we still have a few more weeks left. Um, it has been very helpful for me, I know. Uh, I can say that. It has been convicting and encouraging both. Uh, so before we get started, let's go ahead and pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning and we give you praise. We come with fear and humility uh, because we know that you are good and you are mighty, Lord. You are God, you are King, and you are Lord. We know that you are more powerful than words, more than we can know. And we know that you love us. Thank you, God. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. You took our sin and punishment on the cross many years ago. Remind us of this, Lord. Let us never forget what you have done for us. You have reconciled us to yourself by the shedding of your blood, Lord. We thank you. And Lord, we need you. We still need you. Be with us this morning. Holy Spirit, work in us. Change us and conform us into your likeness. Rejuvenate our hearts and rejuvenate our minds to hear from you. Help us to worship you this morning. Quiet our minds so we may hear from you. We pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. All righty. So, we have two main topics today. Uh, first, we're going to be continuing on in um, Bridges. We're going to be talking about the battle of holiness, the battle of holiness and what that looks like. And then we're going to be looking at the discipline of solitude and silence. Solitude and silence. So let's start with sanctification and the battle for holiness. Uh, for our general discussion on developing a theology and talking about seeking God, seeking holiness, and sanctification, we're going to be looking at chapters 6 and 7 uh, in Bridges and talking about the battle, right? The battle for holiness that is waged inside of us. We had previously, we had discussed how we should think about pursuing holiness. We res wrestled with the question of what part does God play in the process and what part um, does he uh, allow us to play, give us to play? What part do we, do we have in it? We looked at Romans 6 and discussed how when we become Christians, uh, we are freed from the kingdom of sin. Before, we were slaves to sin, ruled by evil, controlled by it. But when we are converted, when we are saved, we are freed from the control of sin. We are freed from the kingdom of sin and now we're in the kingdom of God. But there's a problem. We still find sin warring within us. It's still fighting against us, seeking to control us and to consume us. And so we came to the conclusion, we see that God has made a provision for a holiness. Through Christ, he has delivered us from the sin's reign so that we can now resist sin. But the responsibility for resisting is ours. God does not do that for us. To confuse the potential for resisting, which God provides, with the responsibility 
for resisting, which is ours, is to court disaster in pursuing holiness. And that is kind of where we left off in this topic. Today, we're going to kind of continue this train of thought, continue this idea. And we're going to ask the question, uh, kind of what's next, right? Uh, what do we do against this sin within us? How do we, how do we re resist? Uh, how do we fight? How do we um, fight the battle of holiness? In order to talk about that, we're going to kind of list two important things we need to know uh, in the battle for holiness. In order to win the battle, first, we need to understand that there is a battle within us, and we need to understand the enemy. Second, and most importantly, we need to understand the provision that God gives us to fight the battle. So first, we need to discuss that there is a battle within us. This is what we see in Scripture as the spirit against the flesh, the Holy Spirit against our sinful nature. Romans 7 does a good job of describing this battle. Now, there's various people and various interpretations of Romans 7. Um, I think I even argued with Michael about this at one point. But it, I think it is clear to see that, that Paul is describing in this chapter a battle, internal battle, with sin. Uh, he says, I do the thing I do not wish to do, and the thing I wish to do, I do not do. Right? So he's fighting with his internal self, with the sin, indwelling sin inside of him. Most clearly in verse 21, we can see this picture. Verse 21 of chapter 7 of Romans says, So I find it to be law, or I find it to be a fact, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. And this is the case. This is what we all see. This is what we all experience. We see that we try to do the right thing, yet our sinful nature and our sinful desires still control us to some extent. We still are fighting against it. But if this is the case, it is important that we understand this enemy. We understand the sinful nature, this indwelling sin that resides inside of us. And there are three things we want to consider when we try to understand this enemy, this indwelling sin. The first is that indwelling sin comes from the heart. It comes from the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? says the prophet Jeremiah. In Mark 7, Jesus speaks about what defiles a man. He says, For within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, the evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Our heart and the way that Scripture speaks of it, is the core of who we are, is our complete, holistic whole. It is our reason, our emotions, our will, our soul, all of that taken together. That is our heart, the core of who we are, right? And that is where indwelling sin lies within us. So it's important to know that. Next, um, secondly, we need to know how sin works within us. One of the mo most effective and common ways it works in us is through our desires. Through our desires. Sin takes what are normal desires and corrupts them. And then we listen to these corrupt desires and let them control us and guide us. James describes this process. He says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And that is the process we see. That is how we see sin working. Uh, and when talking about our desires and how it corrupts us, we often hear the people going over the description of uh, what happens with David and when he sins with Bathsheba. We see someone who is drawn by his desires. All right. And slowly, he makes one sin, and then another, and then another, and it brings forth death. Bridges um, describes this process also. Uh, on page 66, uh, he says, If we are to win this battle for holiness, we must recognize that the basic problem lies within us. It is our own evil desires that lead us into temptation. We may think we are merely responding to outward temptations 
that are presented to us. But the truth is, our evil desires are constantly searching out temptations to satisfy their insatiable lusts. Consider the particular temptation uh, or temptations to which you are especially vulnerable. And note how often you find yourself searching out occasions to satisfy those evil desires. I think that's something we can all relate to. So that's one way that sin, indwelling sin works within us. It uses our desires. Next, we need to understand that sin, thirdly, uh, we need to understand that sin corrupts our reason. And this is something that happens bit by bit, right? Our reason, it, it is corrupted by sin, and so we make a slight change, right? A slight deviation, a slight rationalization, a slight justification uh, to conform to our desires. See, our desires are seeking after to fulfill themselves, right? Our evil desires want what they want. And so they argue against our reason. And our reason, being corrupted by sin, begins to adjust, begins to submit to our desires. And so we move from watchfulness, right? Watchfulness to overconfidence. We move from wariness to apathy, right? It's not very often that we move from being very aware and present and trying to focus on not sin and you know, seeking the Lord and moving straight down to the deepest and darkest sins, right? It is one little uh, submission, uh, a move from watchfulness to slightly overconfidence and then from overconfidence into pride and then pride further and further on. It corrupts our reason. So these are the, the kind of the process that indwelling sin works within us. So it's important that we know this about ourselves and know this about the enemy. Now, understanding the enemy is helpful, but it's not the most important knowledge to have in this battle. That is the fact, the most important thing we should know, is the fact that we do not fight on our own. We are not on our own in this battle. Bridges says that it is certainly true that we cannot live a holy life in our own strength. Christianity is not a do-it-yourself religion. We must remember that we are freed from the kingdom of sin, but that wasn't the end. Christ did not free us from the reign of sin to just be subjugated again to it. He does not leave us in a neutral place. No, we are freed from the kingdom of sin and brought into the kingdom of Christ. Psalm 113 says, He raises the poor out of the dust, and he lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He doesn't just pull us out of the ash heap, pull us out of the muck and the mire and the dirt and the filth and leave us to be covered in dirt again. No. He pulls us out and sits us with princes. Princes. He sits us on the hill. He makes us his own. He gives us his spirit to empower and to aliven, to strengthen and encourage, to comfort and to love. So how do we fight this battle? First, we must form the habit of remembering this idea, remembering again, reckoning, as we talked about from Romans 6 a few weeks ago. Reckon. We must consider, think about, remember, right, that we are dead to sin. We are dead to sin and we are alive to Christ. We must consider that again. We must remember again the truth of who we are and where we stand. This is so very important because we forget. We forget. Over and over we forget. We get distracted. We try to do things of our own power, of our own will, of our own strength. We go into autopilot, right? We get pulled this way and that way by our evil desires. We put on the yoke of slavery once again. We forget that we are free men and women, free citizens in God's kingdom. He is our king. We are no longer slaves. And so we must remember that again and again. We must tell ourselves that again and again because we so often forget. That's one of the first ways we can fight the battle. Secondly, we fight the battle by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. 
relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. And we do this by the intake of the Word of God and praying for holiness. One of the chief ministries of the Holy Spirit is to make us holy. That's part of the reason he dwells within us. It is his job to work in us, to change us, to conform us to the likeness of Christ, to show us our sins, to convict us of our sins, and to create a di desire within us for holiness, and to give us the strength and the power we do not have our own, on our own, to overcome that sin. He is the one that does the work. But he gives us a part to play as well. And our part to play, right, is to seek him, is to read his word, right, to wash ourselves in the word of God and to pray diligently. This is a part that he allows us to play, right? In our prayers, he works in us. In our reading of the scripture, he works in us. He moves us, he convicts us, he draws us to him. He makes us holy. That is one way we can fight the battle. Um, as we continue on further this week, uh, through the weeks, uh, Bridges talks more about how we can do that, uh, more important ways and practices we can do uh, to c help encourage us uh, and, and allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. Um, we'll discuss that more as, as kind of we keep going on later. Uh, any questions or thoughts uh, about anything that comes to mind or anything that needs repeated or feel free to, feel free to shout at me or ask a question or whatever, whatever works. Um, I like questions, so, all right. Okay, um, so we're going to pivot now. We're going to move to talk about the discipline of solitude. One way we can kind of continue on this path, right? We can seek holiness um, through this method, uh, the discipline of solitude. Um, loneliness is a very serious problem in our day and age. We are a lonely people, and we are getting more lonely day by day. Uh, the technological age has only increased this, right? Our loneliness has only increased through the use of technology. Uh, and in this past year, I'm sure the effects of COVID have, have driven us further and further into this pit and into this well. And what do we do? We try to fight this loneliness in a lot of ways. Uh, we try to fill our, our time with activities, right? Or plans, or noise, or crowds, or a variety of things. Uh, we leave the TV on in our house so we don't have to hear the silence, right? But we plan all of our uh, free time to spend time with people or activities or whatever other things we have so we cannot be alone, so we don't have to think. Right? The silence and the solitude and the aloneness scares us. But the answer to lon loneliness is not activity, not chatter and noise, it is solitude. It is silence. Solitude, for a definition, solitude is the practice of being alone well. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Uh, and the cultivation of Christian solitude and silence, it can help us be free from loneliness and fear. But solitude in and of itself is not just about being alone. Right? It's not simply just being alone. That's not what it is. It's, it's a little more than that. All right? In the same way you can be lonely yet surrounded by in a crowd, I know sometimes that's when I feel the most lonely. You can practice solitude in a crowd. Or on the other hand, uh, someone that lives alone or as a hermit, right, could be a hermit for years and never see another person and never actually practice solitude. In practicing solitude uh, well, we do not fear being alone or in silence because we know that we are never alone. We know that God is with us. It should be said that the practice of solitude is intimately connected with the practice of silence. These two necessarily go together, right? You can't have one without the other. And like solitude, silence is more than just not speaking, right? Though that can be a part of it, of course. Silence is the practice of controlling the tongue, right? That's what silence is about. So being alone well and controlling the tongue. Those are kind of what we're talking about today. Two things that are very difficult to do. Very difficult to do, especially trying to control the tongue. Now, with both of these practices, as with, as with all the disciplines we've discussed, 
the core of them is to seek after God. We seek solitude. We, we separate ourselves from other people to be closer to God. We sit in silence in order to hear from God and to hear from others. And this is kind of how, a way that the Holy Spirit can work in us, right? To separate ourselves, separated to God, and to sit in silence to hear from him. When we talked about fasting, uh, I said that when I fast personally, it's like, it's like the fog is cleared away a little bit. It's like generally we walk around in a fog and fasting kind of helps clear that away and you can see God moving and working. And I think solitude kind of has a similar effect, right? We are separated from the hustle and the bustle and the activity and the constant noise of life. And it kind of, everything quiets down a little bit. And we can hear a little bit better. We can see a little bit better. And when we do not speak and we control our tongues, Right? We, we're not con so concerned with defending ourselves. Right? We're trying to prove why we did this or explain that. Right? We just are able to hear. Right? If you talk a lot, it's, it's hard to listen. Right? So by separating ourselves, quieting our minds and our activity, uh, controlling our tongue, being in silence, we're able to hear and experience God more fully and completely to see what he is doing. Uh, Foster has kind of a, a sum, summation of these uh, disciplines that I'd like to read uh, on page 108. Let me turn there real quickly. He says, The fruit of solitude is increased sens sensitivity and compassion for others. There comes a new freedom to be with people. There is a new attentiveness to their needs, new responsiveness to their hurts. Thomas Mer uh, Merton observes, it is in deep solitude that I find the gentleness with which I can truly love my brother. The more solitary I am, the more affection I have for them. Solitude and silence teach me to love my brothers for what they are, not for what they say. Don't you feel a tug, a yearning to seek down into silence and solitude of God? Don't you long for something more? Doesn't every breath crave a deeper fuller exposure to his presence. It is in the discipline of solitude that the will uh, that will open that door. You are welcome to come in and listen to God's speech in his wondrous, terrible, gentle, loving, all-embracing silence. And that's kind of what solitude is about. The question then becomes, how do we actually practice these disciplines? Well, Scripture actually gives us a few examples that can be helpful. And Jesus is probably the best example of solitude we have. Um, often he would go off by himself to pray. A few examples, uh, when he spent 40 days in the desert, fasting, alone, and in prayer before he started his ministry. Luke tells us that before choosing the 12 disciples, he spent time alone. And often we see him rising early in the morning to go off and be by himself. This is a common practice of our Lord. But we also have advice about controlling our tongue and silence in the scriptures. Uh, James warns us about the great power of the tongue, calling it a fire that burns down a forest. And in Proverbs, we hear over and over about how the prudent person holds his tongue. Now, Foster in his book kind of gives some tips of how we can do this, how we can practice this. And I've added some of my own as well. So I'm going to talk about a few of those. First, I think some of the easiest way to do is to take advantage of the little solitudes, the little solitudes we get throughout the day. We can seek solitude in the shower in the morning or on the drive to work, on the walk to class. Instead of being on our phones while we eat lunch, we can sit in solitude and in silence and perhaps consider the many blessings the Lord has given us. Right? That's something easy we can do. Right? Take advantage of those little times alone. You can even plan small times of solitude. Perhaps one day a week you can get up a little bit early and seek solitude, like Jesus did. Spend time in prayer, praying for your family or a friend, interceding for someone else. Or perhaps you can take a walk once a week Get a little exercise, which is good, you know. Take a walk in the evening and, and worship God in silence. Quiet the heart. 
Foster recommends uh, going the extra mile and perhaps establishing an area of your home, a section, a room or a place that can be a, a quiet zone, right? a solitude zone, a chair or a room where you can sit and anyone in the house can go and have some quiet time. Time of reflection and worship. You could schedule some times throughout the year to go off, spend some time alone. Uh, I know some people like to go off and camp by themselves or with a few people and kind of have, have some time in the wilderness and seek the Lord that way. Um, this can be a good time to reassess where God is leading you, what he is showing you. Uh, open your heart and your mind to hear from him. Now, some of us may have an easier time with this than others. Uh, I know I particularly like solitude, but I'm also kind of an introvert. I like to be by myself in general. Uh, so it's a little bit easier for me to do that sort of thing. Uh, some of us who are a little more gregarious might find it difficult. Um, but I think those of us that it's equally important for all of us to seek solitude and silence, at least a little bit, at least trying to take advantage of those little solitudes throughout the day, I think can be very beneficial for all of us. Uh, but don't be discouraged, right? This is, it's a process. You know, if this is difficult for you, like any of the other things, it, it takes work. You know, it takes a commitment and a consistent practice uh, to succeed and to, to uh, be successful at these sorts of things. Uh, a good challenge for those of us that might find it difficult is to just go head first, right? Just dive in the deep end. Uh, just pick a day and just don't talk that day, right? Just pick silence. That might be very difficult or downright impossible for some of us because of our work or whatever may happen. Like Michael probably shouldn't pick Sunday to do that. Um, but I think something like that to stretch you, to pull you out of your comfort zone, uh, to make it difficult can really open our eyes uh, to the effectiveness of this discipline and to open our eyes to what God is doing and working. Uh, that can be very, very helpful. So think about that. Uh, think about just maybe, you know, diving in head first. And we can, any of the disciplines uh, that we talked about, you know, just pick one and just go, go for it uh, and, and seek the Lord and rely on him. Uh, any questions about solitude and silence? Uh, any thoughts? Uh, we're very open. Yes, sir. What are you supposed to think about during silence? Great, great question. Um, we've talked about more about meditation and prayer. Uh, silence goes along with those uh, disciplines. Uh, we want to seek the Lord. Uh, we want to seek to focus on who he is and what he has done. Uh, we want to read the scripture, uh, recite it to ourselves. We want to try to quiet our minds to hear from him. Uh, try not to think about some things, you know, um, that sort of idea. Um, just be alone. So uh, those are kind of the things that you would want to look at. Um, meditation on scripture, um, scripture memorization, uh, prayer, um, worship. Uh, you could sing worship songs to yourself uh, in, in silence and in solitude. Um, there are a number of things you, you, you could do in, in that time. Um, is that helpful? Okay, cool. A any, any other thoughts or questions? All right. Um, I do want to say that the goal is, w with all of this, is not, you're not trying to do like all of the disciplines at once. You know, don't try to like fast and solitude and, you know, pray three hours a day and like, you know, at, at once. Like that's probably not the best idea. It, it's to incorporate it into our lives, right? It's to add, maybe, okay, I'll think about adding solitude to my uh, daily practice, right? And then once you kind of get that going, oh, maybe I'll try fasting once a month. You know, and so it's, it's a routine, right? It's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, so be encouraged in that if you're having difficulty. Um, I, know, I know it can be discouraging to try it once and then fail and then never try it again, but don't get discouraged in that way. All right, um, that's all I have for today. Um, come see me if you have any thoughts or questions. I'd love to talk to you. And thank you for being here. Um, I hope it is encouraging to you. Uh, I'll see you all next week.